Hello and welcome to this latest edition of Technicians Update. During the next half an hour or so, we'll take a look at our usual mixed bag of technical bulletins and service fixes. First though, here's Andy with a look at the new Mini Cabriolet. So here it is, the Mini Cabriolet, the latest and perhaps the most impressive model in a long line of limited edition minis produced by Rover. In very basic terms, it's simply a mini that's had its roof replaced with this retractable hood. But of course, it's much more than that. Mechanically, it's much the same as any other Mini, although as you'd expect, the body has been significantly modified. Starting at the front, it features enlarged front wheel arches necessary to clear those huge 16560 tyres. Then further back, you'll see the lower part of the A post has been reinforced with pressed steel box sections that also provide a convenient location for the front speakers. And each of the upper A-posts are reinforced with a stiffener tube that runs from the base of the A-post through to the top. And at the top here is a completely new double-skinned windscreen header that's designed both to tie the two A-posts together and provide a location for the hood when it's up. If we move on to the doors, they're unique to the Cabriolet. They're based on saloon versions that have had the window frame removed from here up to here and then had a new front section bonded to the remaining part of the window section and then welded along to the door here. Again on the inside we can see that the sills have been significantly reinforced by the addition of this box section which is tied into the heel board at the back here which has been effectively doubled up by the addition of another box section. This is designed to give the body a great deal of torsional rigidity which will basically help it stop it twisting. Now the B post has been significantly reinforced and is like the A post also tied into this sill reinforcement. Now they're also via this beam and the window regulator plates tied into both the rear seat bulkhead and the underside of the rear parcel shelf. And just here is where the hood frame mounts. Moving on, the rear quarter panels and the rear panel are like the doors, reworked saloon versions, obviously unique to the Cabriolet. Then at the rear here, the rear parcel shelf is a heavier version than that used on the saloon, which houses in the middle here two inertia rear seat belts. Now if you look inside the boot, you'll see that the new seat belts are supported by an additional box section which welds to the underside of the parcel shelf and the back seat bulkhead. And it's important to remember on the Cabriolet that the rear seat is designed to cater for two people only. Now just before we move on and take a look at the hood assembly on the car, just a quick mention of body repairs. The external panels we've just seen, so that's the windscreen header, the doors, the rear quarter panels and the rear panel can all be replaced. For detailed descriptions of how to carry out those operations and for instructions on all other body repairs, refer to the mini section of the body repair manual, part number SMD 1540, volume 2. Now there's one other important point to remember when carrying out repairs to the body. Always take extra care to make sure you seal all new panels and joints properly and replace any water shedders. That way, any water getting into the body will be correctly directed out of its drain holes rather than being allowed into the car's interior. Now let's take a look at the hood assembly on the car. Unlike the multi-layer assemblies you'd have seen on the 200 Cabriolet, the Mini uses a more simple single-layer design that incorporates a non-removable sewn-in backlight. The cover itself is bonded over a cleverly designed steel frame that, as we've already seen, locates and pivots around this point here just forward of the parcel shelf. A steel rear retainer rail is bonded into the cover and is secured to the parcel shelf by 6-8 mil bolts and they're accessible once the rear parcel shelf trim is lifted. Further forward, the hood cover is bonded to the D-post brackets and then right at the front, it's bonded to the header rail. The header rail itself provides a location for the header seal, the hood handle and the two hood catches that secure the front of the hood to the windscreen header. 
the header itself is secured to the steel frame via four Allen bolts to each side. And to keep the hood cover taut in the up position, you'll find a spring tension cant rail cable runs along the length of the cant rail. There are a number of rubber seals located around the hood designed to combat water ingress. We've already mentioned the header seal, the one that seals the front of the hood to the body. Then there are six further seals located along the top of the door glass and along the top and down the rear edge of the rear quarter light. Further seals can be found around the rear quarter light, at the top at the front here, at the base of the B post here, and along the body line. Now before we open the hood, let's just have a quick look inside. Again, starting at the rear, the hood frame features three spars that span from one side of the frame to the other. The hood cover itself is bonded to each of these spars via flaps of material that hang from the cover and neatly fold round each of the spars. On each side of the hood cover you'll find a wide elastic strap that's pop riveted both at the header and the second two spars and they're designed to hold the hood cover in its correct position each time the hood's raised and lowered. Before we, before we lower the hood what you'll need to do is lower the windows, that's both the rears and the fronts, by at least two turns of their handle to ensure the windows clear the hood frame while it's being raised or lowered. So if I do that now, it's a bit awkward in to lean in to get to the back windows. If we clear those, lean across to get to the front. Lower the sun visors and release the hood catches, which must be left in the open position to prevent damage to the cover when the hood's lowered. Check the hood frames clear of any obstruction and then from outside the car, simply lift the hood down. It will automatically fold down and sit neatly in its correct position, but each time the hood is opened, you should make sure that the backlight has folded without creasing. Once it's in that position, fit the specially padded hood cover that you'll find normally stored in its own bag in its boot. Now, there are a number of important do's and don'ts that you should be aware of regarding the hood assembly. Firstly, you should never open or close the hood while the vehicle's moving and never drive the car with one of the hood catches open or with the hood in the partially open or closed position. You should never drive the car with the hood down without the padded cover fitted. And before you open and close the hood, you should always make sure that any obstructions are clear of the hood frame, including your passengers, before the frames raised or lowered. And you should never attempt to raise or lower the hood unless you're sure you have a ceiling height of at least 2.1 metres. Don't let your passengers sit on a hood frame and never leave the hood frame in the open position for periods of longer than two weeks at a time. Never open or close the hood if the ambient temperature is less than zero degrees centigrade and never wash the car in an automatic car wash or with a high pressure water jet. And finally, you should never fit any stickers to the flexible backlight which should be cleaned regularly using plenty of water. Incidentally, a mild soap solution can be used to clean the rest of the hood. Now, we've already spoken about body repairs, but what about repairs to the hood? Well, most hood components can, if necessary, be replaced individually, although some will arrive partially assembled, such as the hood cover, which will come with the rear retainer rail already bonded in, and the hood frame that will come complete with the elastic straps already fitted. Now, in general terms, repairs to the hood are really quite simple, although to ensure the correct fit and weather sealing, these operations must be carried out with care and precision. The Repair Information Bulletin, number 2493, issued on the 2nd of June this year, gave details of hood repairs, so we won't go through those now. But what we will do is take a look at the checks and adjustments that you can carry out around the hood assembly. We'll first of all look at the seals. 
It's important if water ingress is to be avoided that the seals sit neatly against the top of the side windows and against the body. The cant rail seals are adjustable. It should be adjusted so they sit neatly on top of the door glass and on top of the rear quarter light glass. Their position can be changed by loosening the screw securing the bracket to the frame. Once you've done that you can move the bracket in and out using the slots provided. But before the position of the cant rail seals can be adjusted, what you must do is set the position of the rear quarter light glass. So with the rear seat and the rear quarter trim panel removed, you can carry out the checking and adjusting procedure to the rear quarter light glass. The glass position can be altered once these two bolts, these two nuts and a single glass stop bolt have been loosened. The glass position can't be changed via the regulator, so the four regulator bolts must remain tight. So if we just move the window up, what you'll need to do is use a steel rule and measure from a point on this box section here, as close to the B post as possible, up to the very top of the window glass. And you'll need to make sure that you're not on one of these welds or indeed on this bracket when you do so. The measurement you're looking to the very top of the glass, as I say, is 367 millimetres. With that done, you should check that the seal on the B post here is in line with the seal on the top forward edge of the quarter light. And while you're doing that, make sure it's not tipped forward, which would indicate that the glass has been overwound. Now, if that's all OK, you can secure the glass in its position by tightening the two bolts and the two nuts and then reset the glass stop by bringing it up into connection with the regulator before you retighten it. Now, this joint here is critical. The seal on the upper part of the quarter light should neatly butt down onto the seal on the B post. Eliminate any clearance between the two by simply pushing this clip up or down as required. Now the final adjustment we can make around the rear quarter light is to the inner seal here. When it's correctly adjusted, it should just lightly butt up against the glass. To adjust it, simply loosen these two bolts and move it on the slot provided. Next, we'll check the cant rail position. So with the hood up, you'll need to make sure that the cant rails are nice and level and that they don't dip or peak around this joint here. If they do, then you'll need to half open the hood again. And then with the hood in the half open position, you'll need to loosen and adjust the position of this cam which acts on a stop on the frame and controls its position. Now one other point, if for any reason you're refitting a hood frame to the car, then you must secure it using this procedure. First of all, drop the frame onto the car and then loosely secure it with the four pivot bolts and the six rear retainer bolts that hold the back of the hood to the parcel shelf. With the bolts in position loosely, Hold the frame in the halfway up position and secure the rear retainer bolts starting at the left hand side working over to the right making sure the rear retainer sat nicely onto the body. Once you've done that, allow the hood to drop gently and sit on its own weight in its folded position. In that position you can tighten up the pivot bolts each side and then when that's done, close the hood up and if necessary, adjust the hood catches to the windscreen header. Now, that should have given you a good insight into the new Mini Cabriolet. And don't forget, if one does find its way into your workshop, all the service and repair information can be found in your workshop manual, or indeed the body repair manual. Mark. Okay.
Let's move on now and take a look at a problem that's been occurring on some 218 and 418 turbo diesels. Now Rover 200 400 bulletin number 34 covers the subject of turbo noise. Now the problem itself isn't down to the turbo. What is causing the problem is the heat shield, or to be more precise, this edge here. Now what happens is the edge fouls the turbo body, causing a high pitched whine. To cure it you'll need to remove the heat shield and trim away part of this edge here. You can see roughly how to do it from this one I've marked up. When you've done that you can refit the modified heat shield and road test the car. Staying with diesels for the moment, there have been a number of cases of lack of power on 825s. Now as you're probably well aware, there are a number of things that could cause this problem. A blocked fuel filter, incorrect injection pump timing, or a faulty injection pump to name but a few. Now, one thing that you should add to this list of possible causes is insufficient clearance between the bottom of the fuel tank and the fuel pickup pipe. Now, what happens is that as fuel is drawn up the pickup pipe, the bottom of the tank lifts and sits against or very close to the bottom of the pickup pipe. Now, this obviously restricts the amount of fuel drawn up the pickup pipe and causes the lack of power. Now, the problem may become more noticeable when the level of fuel in the tank is low. In other words, the less the weight of fuel holding the bottom of the tank down, the more it will rise towards the bottom of the pickup pipe. Now, what you'll need to do to get over this problem is rework the pickup pipe itself. Right, what you've got to do is file or cut off this end part of the pipe here. You've got to have a vertical height of 3 millimetres plus 6 millimetres along the bottom. Now, what happens then with the end of the pipe cut away, fuel can still be drawn up the pipe, even if the bottom of the tank is being sucked up against this bottom edge. When you're reworking the pipe, make sure you don't damage either of these two pipes. When you refit it, make sure it's deburred, cleared of all swarf and thoroughly cleaned. You can then road test the car to check that you cured the problem. Now one thing that you should be aware of is that later cars are fitted with a pickup pipe modified to this latest condition. Moving swiftly on now, we'll take a look at a problem that's been occurring on some 1.4 multi-point K-series engines. The problem centres around this thing here, the vacuum pipe. Now in some cases oil has been getting into the vacuum pipe, causing a flat spot, poor performance or in some cases stalling. What I'll do now is go through a fix that's covered in Rover 200-400, bulletin number 33. What the bulletin goes through is increasing the length of this stub pipe here. I'll use the flip chart again to show you what we're trying to achieve. Now what happens is that oil lying in the bottom of the inlet manifold runs down the stub pipe and into the ECU. This is due mainly to the fact at the inner end of the stub pipe lies flush with the bottom of the inlet manifold. Now if we increase the length of the stub pipe and raise the inner end so that it stands proud of the bottom of the inlet manifold while still keeping the same amount protruding on the outside, this means that any oil lying in the bottom of the manifold won't be able to flow down the stub pipe and into the ECU. What you'll need to do is make a new stub pipe using 3 16th brake pipe. Now your new stub pipe should be 50 millimetres long. Now the bulletin goes through the job in more detail, but basically what you've got to do is remove the old pipe, drill out the hole to 3 16th to accept the new pipe, and clean away any swarf. Now before you fit the new pipe, cover it in Loctite 638 to hold it in position. When you push it in, Make sure you leave 20 millimetres protruding from the outside. Well, after carrying out the fix, if you still have a problem, contact dealer service. Now before we go, we should just mention this year's auto course. Now the winners should have been contacted already. They'll enjoy an all expenses paid trip to Turkey. If you want to be in the running for this year's big prize, make sure you sign up for Auto Course 94. Well that just about wraps up this edition of Technician's Update. I hope you found the last 30 minutes or so of use to you. See you next time.
nearly all of the recent warranty returns of the fuel hose that connects between the fuel filter and the fuel rail on multi-point K and T-series engines have shown signs of damage to the O-ring seal. Our investigations have shown that in all cases where the seal has been damaged, the cylinder head has been recently removed, an operation which involves the disconnection of this hose. Now it's quite easy to damage the O-ring when you're refitting the hose to the fuel rail as it's quite a tight fit into the fuel rail for obvious reasons and the leading edge of the fuel rail can be quite sharp. So it's essential that you lubricate the O-ring with a generous quantity of petroleum jelly and take extra care when refitting the hose to the fuel rail. A repair information bulletin will be issued shortly to enable you to update your manuals.